Prospects 70 to 56 on the top 100 list here, which means we'll be starting with Jace Young and finishing with AJ Smith Shaver. So we'll be covering all of our bases here. I'm Arm Waiting. He's Jack McMullen. This will be the last one of the week, of course, as we're recording this on Friday, putting it out on Friday. But we're also going to be putting out some breakout prospect stuff probably over the weekend or you know, kind of spilling into early next week because we want to make sure that we stamp those prospects we think are going to break out before uh, they start to do it. Uh, I'm really excited. Today is minor league opening day I'm on the AAA side. I hope you enjoyed big league opening day yesterday. I mean, it's you know one of the best days of the year for so many reasons, but I'm also very jazzed up about AAA opening day, Jack. And I think a couple of the guys that we're going to talk about here in this band uh, we'll get their first games, first starts, first ABs of the season uh, out of the way today. Yeah, a hundred percent. Indy is opening in Louisville, calling it from Indy, but uh, we got Michael Plasmeyer starting on opening day for Indy, but then it's Skeens on Saturday, Priester on Sunday. Very fun. It's like that is really fun. There's a level of intrigue with AAA opening day and we, and yep. with AAA games that like. You know, A, you get to turn on Merrill Kelly. Merrill Kelly's awesome. But, like, wouldn't you rather watch Quinn Priester and see if he's, like, in the mid-90s instead of the low-90s? I don't know. If that's the way my brain ticks, I know that's the way your brain ticks. And I'm sure a lot of you you prospect degenerates like us, that's the same way that your stuff ticks, too. A hundred percent. And I, I would uh, – I think it would make a lot of sense for you to be out there for that series. That would be fun to, to see you from there. But, um, you know – uh, they'll they'll be back in Indy in what a few days after yeah, that Tuesday. series. Yep. Tuesday. So that'll be fun. And will Skeens be making a start? Will will that line up with the first home series where he'll still be able to make a start then too? Oh yeah, baby. Oh he'll yeah. Start. I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait to hear your thoughts and takeaways on that. And of course, we'll we'll probably have a couple episodes of breakout candidates stuff like that before that. But it'll be fun to recap the first week of of AAA ball and even just the first weekend uh, because there's a lot of intriguing and exciting arms and and, and hitters that are going to be you know getting going here this weekend. But let's jump right into it at, at number seventy. And as always, link episode description, YouTube. You can follow along with us right here. But number seventy. Jace Young, Detroit Tigers. This guy just keeps hitting for power, you know, just continues to produce. And it's just becoming increasingly difficult to deny the bat. Uh, not that anybody was really going out of their way to deny it, but the question was, you know, if he's not hitting for the same amount of, of power, right? If he's not slugging, there's a little concern because the hit tool is fringy and there's some defensive limitations. I, I know he won the gold glove at second base in the minor leagues. But at the end of the day, it's it's going to be second base at best, and I don't think it's going to be a, a plus second base at the uh, at the big league level. So it's a lot on the bat. He's somewhat aggressive as well. So you know, he again, he really needs to be slugging when he's making contacts. But I think when people question the bat angle and the setup and things like that, now I think you you can start to understand why he does it and how it works for him. Everything he squares up is in the air with backspin. So when he squares it up, it's a high probability extra base hit or home run. And that's why he's a guy that I think is going to consistently you know, produce and consistently slug, even if the hit tool isn't totally there. But I do think that there's enough there to get too close to an average hit tool or an average hit tool. This guy ran a 35% ground ball rate between high A and double A in 2023. So like, I love that point that you made. If you had questions about the unorthodox setup – those should have all been answered by 28 homers. Like yep. it's, it's the Isak Paredes conversation where it's like, this is just going to happen because of the way the swing is designed. Jace Young has a very fun swing that is designed that way. Problem is his future home ballpark is very hard to hit into the power alleys and dead center. But like, why can't this guy like play, play with the left field or play with the right field corner? Like, that kind of thing. I I am very excited to see what this guy's power profile looks like in that ballpark. Yeah. But we know we're getting a serviceable defensive second baseman and a guy that's going to lift at all times. Yeah. I think you bring up a great point because that is one of the concerns because Jace does get into his pull side pop well, and there's plenty of bombs he hit last year that, you know, were well gone over that right field wall, as you mentioned, but he's also a guy that really likes to work through center field and he maintains his direction really well. And again, I think part of that setup 
that he has is, you know, most people when they're trying to to generate lifts, like consistently, try to trying to create that angle with the best of them, like an Isak Paredes, he's got to do it to his pull side. That's the easiest way to consistently generate that that lift and that angle. But somebody like Jace Young, who just has a very unique ability to you know, create that angle and, and lift to all fields and, and kind of have that path through the zone. He had a lot of home runs, hit a lot of home runs to center field last year. And again, I think that's part of the reason why he he has that angle to start. He feels like it just gets him, you know, on plane and, and allows him to drive balls in the air with carry to center field as well and maintain that direction. So, okay, I can go and try to lift the baseball without pulling too much. And again, when he needs to, he will pull it. The problem is, you know, if you now put him in Detroit, in Comerica, there's at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of his home runs that by the ballpark would not have gotten out in center field. Maybe they could have been extra base hits. I'm not totally sure. But those are, you know, if you're looking at just the spray chart and then you yeah. put it in, you know, Comerica, he's losing some home runs there. A lot of those could end up being gappers and maybe he leans a little bit more into the pull side you know, approach, but that is a little bit of a concern, a guy that's going to need to slug playing in that ballpark, but you don't bake that into your prospect evaluations because he could get traded. So many different things could happen. They could randomly decide to move the walls in. That's not enough to change our perspective on him, but it is something worth noting if you're a Tigers fan, you know, just it might impact that power, maybe like a half grade in terms of like output. Yeah. Do you think there is an appropriate profile comp for Chase Young, like a second baseman that doesn't run well, but he can hold his own defensively and and he's going to get into the juice? He walked 80 times last year, like it was an 110 point jump from average to OBP, but it's not the elite, you know, selection that some of those like, you know, on base machine second basemen are. I, I struggle to find a, a clear cut comp for this guy. And that's, that might be a good thing. Yeah. I, I think it's a, I think it's a good thing. I think that, you know, you could also bake in the fact that they were playing him at third a lot in spring training and, and maybe he's going to try to, they're going to continue to try to develop him at third. And then of course, if he can play third, you can think of a lot of players who fit that profile, but yeah, I don't know. We haven't really had like that, that big slugging second baseman. I feel like in a, in a little bit in terms of, the way that Jace Young is doing it uh, that I, I think makes him fun and, and, and pretty unique, but a pretty desirable player. Uh, I think in this game, especially now where, you know, you want guys that can slug in any spot. There's not the the contact oriented second baseman that you have to have. Uh, the, the, the game isn't begging for Luis Castillo. So I do think those guys are more welcome now uh, because of, of where we've trended. Uh, Jace Young, I think is that modern, exciting second baseman that can really pack a punch. Number 69, a super contact-oriented, well-rounded player we've talked about quite a bit here on the call-up. Luis Lara, outfielder, Milwaukee Brewers, went went yard in the big league spring training game uh, just before the end of, of spring training and is just somebody that I think is a high-floor player, which you don't get to say much about teenage prospects at the lower levels. High probability big leaguer in my mind because of the, the field to hit from both sides of the plate, I, I think it's a potential double plus hit tool. You have a really good approach, especially for his age and, and his level, which I think is the plate discipline is could track closer to, to plus or even better than that. Look, there's not going to be much power here. It's probably going to be below average at best. But when you have the field to hit, the ability to get on base, enough gap to gap ability because he, he does hit a lot of line drives and then he can stick in center field. He's not the sexiest top 100 prospect, but I think he's incredibly underrated for that reason. And, you know, we, we are always looking for these types of players. Like, again, I, I think the game has gotten to the point where we're always coveting the power, the excitement and things like that. But as we mentioned, like there is some more interest now, I think, in, in finding these types of players as well, especially in farm systems that are, you know, have so much talent, but are also volatile like Luis Lara is kind of cut from that South Freelich uh, cloth where, you know, it could be a little bit more exciting than people think, but you feel really good about what you're, you're most likely going to get. I, I love that, you know, you are, are kind of teasing the idea of the cycle back when it comes to hitting value. And we're never going to get back to 300 is everything because it's not like power is not everything, but it's a lot. I, 
I dream of the day in baseball where we find a hybrid where you've got five power guys in your lineup. You got four bat to ball guys in your lineup and you feel like you have a very balanced lineup. And I think that we will get there at some point. Um, But now like it's clear at this point that a major league baseball team would rather run out, you know, nine guys that can hit 30 homers as opposed to nine guys that can hit 300 because the value is there. But this guy does fill a role in the modern game again, and and it is throwback. Um, I'm curious if you feel like this guy is going to be one whose value kind of transcends the baseball reference page. Like, because I think a lot of prospect people will see Luis Lara, who is that? They pull up baseball reference, and they see a 730 OPS. You got to remember that he is an 18 year old that just spent time for the most part in low A, then a little bit in high A. Do you think that this is a guy who it's like, hey, it's always going to be a 770, 70, 770, 780, but he's going to be better than that by value? I, I definitely think so. Um, because he's a guy, if you watch him play, the instincts are are off the charts in terms of just like he has just a knack for being in the right spot. The way he plays, he always grabs that extra 90 feet. Uh, all the little things that he does, he's, he's ahead of his years. And that's why in his age 18 season, he played the whole year in low A. And then you mentioned got to high. A. It wasn't like the, you know, Sebastian Walcott, like four games. It was, it was 17 games there. And, and in those 17 games, is a, in his 18, age 18 season, you know, in, in high A to go there and hit 290 in 79 plate appearances, I think is, is really impressive. He stole eight bags as well. Like he's really instinctual. He's a well-rounded player. I don't think he puts the ball on the ground too, too much for a guy of his type. Like he does a really good job of, of balancing that where, yeah, if he's, if he's hitting the ball in the air all the time, it's going to be a problem because he's not going to hit it hard enough. But at the same, with that same note, like this contact oriented guys end up putting it on the ground way too much. And you know, again, really good defenses will just get you out. So he's found that balance where, I think, you know, he will he will drive it in the air and split the gaps, but also it was mostly line drive oriented. Does I think he avoids putting the ball on the ground weekly pretty well. His swing is pretty consistent from both sides of the plate, a little bit more productive from the left side, which you know you always if you're gonna have one side that you're a little better like better from, you always want that to be the left side. Uh, but I just feel like there's a lot of different ways to get to an 800 OPS or close to it. And I think the reason why people just covet those power guys is you can walk and slug and, and get there. It's a little bit easier to convert, you know, on those guys, because yeah. if Laura starts to see that hit tool struggle a little bit more, like doesn't make bat to ball as, as consistent as, you know, he has at the lower levels, which tends to happen. Like then there's a lot of pressure on him to be able to convert to that plus hit tool. And I think that's why in the scouting ranks and, and, and with what teams covet, like, it's easier to just go attack the power guy, hope the hit tool develops and, and really hone in on the approach. Whereas it's really hard to to properly predict how a hit tool is going to translate for these young teenage players who may be more advanced than their peers. So you really got to look at the swing mechanics. You really got to look at the underlying data. But now that we have so much more information at our disposal, I think that's another reason why teams are going to start to gravitate more towards the Luis Suarez. And I, I think that He's a guy that is going to be considered a top 100 prospect across the game after this year. When you consider the way he can walk, manage strikeouts at is one of the best, you know, as one of the best guys in the lower levels at doing that. Can get to double A now at age 19. I assume he's going to get there you know, before the end of the season and then play a good center field and do all the little things as well. That's an, I feel like a lot of contact oriented hitters are unfairly tabbed with the 300, 300, 300 slash line, you know, like template. That's not Lara because of the plate discipline. And that's why this new grade is so important. You've got a guy that can kind of settle into a 65 plate discipline. So instead of 300, 350, 350, we could be looking at, you know, 290 or let's call it 300 for the sake of round numbers. We could be looking at a 300, 390 or 400, and then like a 380 as well. And, and that's very valuable. Walks are very important especially for contact oriented guys, because we talk about bats slumping and the whole idea about walks don't slump. Guess what? If you can hit, if you can spray the ball around and you can walk, it's hard to close your eyes and see an elongated slump. It's also really hard to get you out. And and, and it's also another valuable thing, right? Just grinding pitchers out. And, and it's, it's similar to that, you know, Stephen Kwan type of, of cloth. And actually thing I, in the, in the write-up kind of got into that, where he's putting up exit velocities now that are pretty much on par with what Stephen Kwan does now. So I think that template's kind of there. Kwan walks a ton as well and doesn't slug much, 
and plays good defense in a corner. At the very least, Lars is going to play really good defense in a corner. I think there's a lot of similarities to Quan here, and he's more advanced than Quan was at 19 years old for sure. Jumping into the next outfield prospect here, number 68 is Drew Gilbert of the New York Mets. And another guy that's not the biggest in stature and the field ahead is, is definitely a, a big part of his game. But I think you have the potential for average power here, maybe a little bit more. Another hitter with, I think, pretty good plate discipline. It's a plus runner, and he can play above average defense in center field. This is your classic. Nothing's going to jump off of the page, but there's really no deficiency. Uh, he, he hit lefties well last year, which you dug up for me the other day. We were talking about that because I watched him get blown up left on left on the backfields. I'm like, whoa, wait, did he happen to have problems left on left? Turns out it was just Chandler Joswiak being funky and and, and just tough to hit because yeah. Gilbert was almost re actually reverse splits last year. Um, but it, it's there's a, you can understand why the Mets went out and targeted him because you know, in, in that Verlander deal, I mean, Gilbert's a guy that, the Mets aren't trying to go full tear down rebuild. They want pieces for the next year or so. And Gilbert can be up next year and be an above average big leaguer even by, you know, the next couple of years. He's going to start in AAA. He and Luis on Helicuna are both going to be in AAA. Clifford is not ready for AAA yet. Um, I assume Clifford will probably go to high A or you think double? I think probably high A. Probably high A. But Gilbert is a guy that, you know, like we'll we'll see how long the Harrison Bader thing lasts. If it does last for 162, then Gilbert might just spend the entire year in AAA. But this is a guy that could totally go play center field for the New York Mets come August 1st if if they do decide to move Bader and and they can get you know some pitching in return or, or something like that. He is probably one of the best all around guys on this top 100. And all around, I mean 50s, 55s, maybe a 60 across the board. Like, Outside of the top top dogs, absolutely. But yeah, like and the top top the top top dogs, like they all do something great. You know, what I mean? like yeah. a Jackson Holiday. Yes, he's an all around player, but he's got seventy plate discipline and a borderline seventy hit. Like yeah. Gilbert does not have that. So I'm thinking the all around solid guy, mm -hmm. the Michael Bush esque guys. Um, Bush is on this list. Tommy Troy is probably the best of that grouping, but Gilbert is not far behind. Yeah, because well, oftentimes, you know, those guys don't have the defensive ability or value like like a Michael Bush where, you know, it's, it's his offensive game is so well-rounded. But Gilbert, you know, you got the balanced offensive game. Then you've got the, the the intangibles too. another just gamer, absolute gamer. And then the ability to stick in center field. It, it's just your classic. You're not going to find much of a deficiency one way or another. He may not be an all star. He, I think he can. But you feel really good about the fact that he could be a, 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 an everyday player and, and handle center field and get there relatively quickly. I think we could see him. Wouldn't be crazy to see him by the end of this year, but most likely makes sense, you know, early, early next year to get that full run. But I think we'll probably see a September call up or a little bit earlier here if the, if the Mets want to do that, like you said earlier, especially after a trade. 67, another prospect who was traded at, at the deadline. Last year, inexplicably by the Angels, Edgar Caro, Chicago White Sox. It's nice to see more White Sox on this list. And you know, we've got several on, on this list now as they finally, you know, have moved some pieces. And Caro was probably one of the most impressive moves that they made because I just couldn't believe that they could get Edgar Caro uh, in, in a deal like that. But he is, we talk about the offensive side of things, really high floor because you have a, a fringe plus hit tool and another guy with plus plate discipline. The game power right now is, is below average, but I do think that there's enough in there for him to hit 10 to 15 home runs. And then the defense is a work in progress, but it has progressed. Uh, I think he has continued to get better defensively. And, and remember, this is a guy that skipped high a entirely last year. I thought that the, the way that people adjusted their assessments on him was crazy considering that he skipped high A, went straight to the Southern League with the tacked balls, mm -hmm. and was like the, one of the youngest players there. Wasn't getting blown up. He just wasn't hitting for power uh, and and you know just wasn't quite performing the way that I think people were hoping he would after the monster numbers he put up you know, in low A. I think it's nuts how uh, how people shifted on him so quickly considering the way he finished the year after he got traded to the White Sox and also just considering the talent 
Uh, bat to ball wise, the another guy that just gets lauded for the intangibles. Why that's also why he skipped high A and a guy that still hits the ball hard enough. So it it blows my mind that you're one of two like major outlets that have him on the top 100. Edgar Carroll was 89 on prospectus going into 23, and then he's now 78 going into 24. I don't know how this guy's not a top 100 prospect for some of the other major outlets that we've got. It's just bizarre to me because he was so young and because he handled double A how he handled it, man. 101 games, this guy slashed 255, 380, 351. Mm -hmm. You're telling me that a 20-year-old catcher that held his own behind the plate with a 380 OBP is not a top 100 prospect? Very odd. But I, I don't I'm excited it. to see what Carroll can do. He was not on Charlotte's roster, so Carroll is going to start the year in double A. Like, I'm not digging him for repeating double A because he's probably only going to be there for one or two months. Yeah. And, and again, like, he, he skipped Ty A, so it's okay. And so you get, get some more experience. Also, they probably want him working with a lot of those top pitching prospects. Is Birmingham's going to be loaded. And they got Iriarte there. They've got Drew Thorpe there. They're going to have Eater there, I think, too, also repeating, if I'm not mistaken. So, so. You, know, you have Carroll working with the guys that you imagine he's going to be up at the big leagues with next year. So I think that perspective, I, I imagine they might just kind of go in tandem together. I mean, Caro is the clear cut future catcher of this Oregon, even if the defense is, is, is fringy, even if it is, you know, in a spot where he may be, if you look at defensive war, like slightly below average, I think some of the things that, you know, I, we wrote about it here, but like some of the things that he's improved, like he was always a good blocker and now the receiving's gotten better. And he, he's thrown down nearly 30% of base dealers as a pro. So, like, if he can just do everything fine, which I think he more than he's more than capable of doing, the offense is going to be great. And, and catcher, now we're seeing that, too, also kind of turn into a, a pretty offensively driven position, uh, especially with some of the things that we think could happen, you know, with the game in terms of receiving. But, you know, you have above average hit from both sides of the play. I, I think it could end up being plus. I, I probably should throw in the possibility there of like a future 60. You look at the final 50 games of the season. Again, I understand that he didn't light it up. It's a 709 OPS. I get it. But also the average numbers in the Southern League weren't even that great in the second half either. He ran a contact rate in the zone at 90%. And overall through that stretch, he ran a chase rate below, well below 20%. And he, he walked more than he struck out. This was a guy that, you know, was one of the younger players there again. So uh, I think the the fatigue on Caro was surprising considering, you know, he, he I thought, did some really good things for his age. And if you look at some of the expected stats, uh, they kind of point towards some some bad, batted ball luck. So I'm pumped to see him in double A I, I, uh, just to start the year because I think he's going to get off to a great start and yeah. parlay that momentum into triple A when he probably jumps up there with Iriarte and Thorpe maybe a month or two into the season. Uh, but, yeah, I, I'm with you. Definitely unfair on on the rankings i think on edgar caro number 66 another catcher and the more that i've been able to dive in and watch him we talked about it when we broke down the yankees top prospects the more i've liked him austin wells yankees catching prospect but not anymore uh, i think very soon he'll just be yankees catcher uh trevino does some good things and i think that's a really good tandem there because i think trevino helps do a lot of the things that wells is not as proficient at which is the defensive side but Wells has improved mightily. He was a guy that I thought might move off of the position. Now I think he's a guy that's actually borderline average at the position. He's not the best with his arm, but the way that he rectified that was getting the ball out quicker. And that can be hard. You got to be really, really quick. But he's worked on that to the point where, you know, he is, he's got the ball in his hand and he's throwing it. You know, we do pop time. Obviously, it's going to be from the time you catch it and then the time that it gets to, to second base. But with him, if you did it from like just the the release time from like catch to to release, it's probably got to be one of the most improved I've seen in the minor leagues. And then you've got the blocking that's continued to improve. The receiving's been the thing that stands out the most. Like he actually graded out as a, as a fine receiver in his big league stint, which is impressive as well. But this is a guy that's going to hit, and, and I think give you a lot of fun pop from the left side of the plate as a catcher. So if the if the defense is average or close to it. The power can be comfortably above average. I think he can hit 20 to 25 home runs. He historically walked. He's become more aggressive, but in the same in that same note, like he's also become better bat to ball wise, especially after the Yankees had to make a little bit of an adjustment 
over his final like 12, 13 games, he was barreling everything. And I mean, that was against Jordan Romano, Kevin Gosman, uh, Merrill Kelly. Like he was taking some of the best pitchers in the game deep and it was just off of a subtle change. So defense close to average offense, really starting to break through. He's probably going to be closer to 240 hitter, but I think that walk rate is going to continue to creep up, especially as he matures. And if it's 20 to 25 home runs and average defensive catcher, that's a well above average catcher at the big league level. So my favorite thing about Austin Wells that nobody really acknowledges is he picks his spots on the base paths better than most in his minor league career. He's 39 for 40 in the stolen base department. He that's was pretty 16. crazy. I, it's crazy because you look at him and you see like the chest hair popping out from the Jersey and you see the mustache. Like you're like, okay, yeah, you're not a base dealer. 16 for 16 in the minor leagues in 2021. 16 for 16 in the minor leagues in 2022. <laughs> and then last year, seven for eight in the minor leagues. He didn't attempt one in the major leagues. But I mean, this guy is somebody that, you know, all of a sudden you get 15 stolen bases from your catcher. You're like, whoa, this is a whole new dynamic. And we talk about how the Yankees are starved for base running talent and starved for speed. He's not speedy. He's a 40 runner, but he is a selective base stealer. Yeah. And the Freddie Freeman stolen base elevates the Dodgers. The JT Real Muto stolen base elevates the Phillies. So why can't 10 to 15 stolen bases from Austin Wells elevate the New York Yankees? I, I'm a I, big I mean, fan of what that what that dynamic adds. I, I love it. And I think it's also just a testament to the like just the intangibles there too. I think that's mm -hmm. got to be the trend of like this group. Um and, and I think it's probably like it just the the that's where this this range of players typically is, right? It's going to be guys that are, maybe aren't as talented as guys in the top top uh, around them in the top 100, but maximize a lot of their abilities with those intangibles. So that is kind of is the intangibles band, which is funny. I didn't even realize that, but once you go through it, you start to realize some of the things you repeat a bit more. But he's hitting the ball really hard, especially the spring training. He had a great again. I think he's going to whiff. I think he's going to whiff like a fair amount, and, and that might tick down as he you know just gets more experience. And spring training is kind of a perfect example. He hit 300 with a 941 OPS, but he also struck out 16 times in 46 plate appearances. But again, like a lot of a lot of hitters are gonna are gonna strike out a little bit. And he cut that down kind of as the spring progressed. It was the first couple games where I think he shook the rust off. But I, I think if there's one deficiency with Wells, it's still gonna be limiting the running game. And I think that's where at times, like, you know, if you have a pitcher that's maybe slower to home plate, those will be the games where Trevino get gets the start. But at the end of the day, if Wells can still throw out 15% of base dealers, which I think he's more than capable of doing, the blocking and receiving has gotten so much better and the offense is, is so good that I think you combine that tandem and they balance each other out to do some really good things. And I think the, the Yankees have their best catching situation in, in quite some time now with Wells there alongside Trevino. Wow. Number 65, another Chicago White Sox prospect here on the pitching side, Noah Schultz. We actually got a chance to talk to him. Uh, on the call up that that interview should be out in one of the last few episodes that we we put out from that eBay event. Um, Schultz is extremely young. <laughs> like it, this was another one of those examples where I was just like, oh man, I'm starting to realize how much older I am than these guys. But Schultz, you know, I'm looking at it. Well, first of all, he's towering over me. He's like six yeah. nine, but he also has like this baby face, and he he just he's he's like a, he's like a guy that just graduated high school. You know, that's what he looks like. But also. You know, just really nice. I love the way that he kind of goes about his business. He seems like he's just having fun, but also really excited to build on. I think what he started to realize is he's really rare talent. Like it was just funny to be able to talk to him and just hear, like, did you really ever think that you had this much in you? You know, there's so many tall pitchers that you watch them throw. Like you remember the kids from like high school, you see this like six foot five, six foot six kid. And then it just all looks so slow. And you're just like, oh, like, it was just fascinating to hear from him. Like when you kept growing like that, were you shocked at how explosive you still were? And it, it's amazing. Like, I don't think he knows any other way. And he's built like a guy that could be a power forward in terms of like the height. He'd probably need to put on a little bit more weight. Uh, but at the same time, he's got some crazy arm speed. He's pretty twitchy for a guy that big. And that's why he's able to throw into the mid nineties pretty easily and rip off some disgusting sliders. So when I think really tall, I think guys like Sean Jelly, who, again, everything's moving very slowly. And it's like, hey, where's the ball going? Because there are way too many moving parts and your limbs are too long. 
Chris Young was a big guy that controlled himself well, but again, he was moving very slowly and that kind of allowed him to, to pinpoint and carve out a pretty long major league career. But at the end of the day, like he was throwing 89 when he was six, eight, like you should be throwing a hundred like Noah Schultz yeah. can get up to. Um, the other one is Randy Johnson, but Randy Johnson for my money is the greatest pitcher of all time. Pound for pound. Like Schultz, he's not Randy Johnson. He's not Chris Young. He's not Sean Jelly. What this guy is, is a very tall young man, you know, like borderline kid that happens to move exceptionally well for somebody that's 6'9", 220, like you're saying. And, you know, there are guys like that. There are guys that just look like blown up versions of six foot one people that operate like they're six foot one, but they're bigger. Um, and those are the ones that go top 10 in the NBA draft. Um, and and those are the guys that can climb quickly as as pitchers in baseball too. And I think just building off of that, you had his pro debut. Unfortunately, went down with a little bit of elbow issues, so he, he's going to be back and ready to go. But they're going to manage his innings pretty carefully, anywhere from sixty five to to eighty. Apparently, um, but, he's going to Winston Salem, which is high A. Perfect. I, you know, I think it doesn't even really matter where he throws. Like if he's on, he's going to be great. So you might as well just have him build up in high A. And I think we'll probably get a taste of double A before he hits that, that innings total. But what's, what's amazing to me is you mentioned the way he moves and, and, and we were talking about the explosiveness and just being a little bit more unique than most uh, tall young left-handers that you're going to see. He filled up the zone man. 63% strike rate overall and 38 strikeouts against six walks in, in his 10 appearances last year. I mean, that's, that's, again, it's really impressive. We're expecting like a Maddox Bruns type of situation here, right? If you tell me, oh, 6'9 lefty that can run it up to the upper 90s and his best pitch is this wipeout slider, I'm saying, oh, man, what is it, five walks per nine? Yeah, he can't throw a strike, right? And it's a 5.8% walk rate so far as a pro. Um, I'm I'm really excited to see how he, he continues to build. And the changeup started to flash a little bit at the end of last year, so – or, you know, at the end of us seeing him last year. So, I mean, this is a guy that could have a ton of helium uh, it, with, with a healthy and, and nice start to the season. 64, big leaguer, guy who made the roster and much deserved. Sedan Rafaela, outfielder with the Boston Red Sox, phenomenal defender. We know that he can play plus plus defense in center, can play great defense at short. And now we've seen the hit tool come along. We've seen the approach come along a little bit, and we've seen that power. Flash to, to clearly be be slightly above average, I think, at least, but at least average at the big league level. If he's going to be an average hitter with average power, maybe a little bit more than that, and an elite base dealer with elite defense in center field who can also plug into shortstop, so that's a very dynamic and fun player. How about that triple to left field in in the opener? Did you see that? Yeah. I That was game changing speed game wrecking speed and, and the fact is like he saw that a throw was you know almost lackadaisically coming into the cutoff man and and he said you know what like you're not going to respect me i'm i'm going to go and i do love the first x amount of games for a prospect when they still have prospect status i think you do see it for the most part from every rookie across the board they're always going to be hard out of the box. And, you know, once you kind of establish your footing in Major League Baseball, that's when you start to worry about longevity over 162. But this guy was clearly going full bore, like full speed. And you saw it at the end of last year. I think you're going to see it for at least the first couple months of this year. This guy at full speed is a very unique baseball player mm -hmm. and one that is going to, I think, accumulate war. Oh, yeah. Red Sox. I think this guy is going to be wore out the wazoo. I agree. Uh, even if he's not hitting, you know, the way that you hope. But I, I think he can. And I think there's been some clear improvements, especially just being able to hit fastballs. And I feel like he's been super aggressive. And I think that's part of what has resulted in more whiff. So far, you know, when we saw in spring training, the whiff was, was better. It seemed like he was just able to make more consistent contact. I, it's hard to take much from the, the chase rates in such a small sample, but it, they were lower significantly than what we saw from him last year. So that is good. Uh, you know, guys that are chasing at around a 40% clip are usually even a, in a small sample going to chase around a 40% clip. Uh, so that part is is really encouraging as well. If, if he can cut down even slightly on the chase and whiff, a, a 40 hit and a, and a 40 approach with his skills will still play because he hits the ball in the air. He hits the ball pretty hard. He is going to do all the things that you mentioned in terms of taking the extra 90, 
he's going to steal a ton of bags and he's going to be one of the better defensive center fielders in baseball who could also plug in at shortstop for you. That's just, that's just dynamic. And that's just the way that, you know, I think he was able to, to make the team. They need, he can fill so many gaps for this Boston Red Sox team. And I think that's absolutely huge for them. And I think he's going to get a lot of run this year. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah. 63. Chase Hampton, Yankees prospect, who has one of the better fastballs I think you're going to see that isn't 99 in the minor leagues. But it also is just like one of the better fastballs. It's it better than plus. I think by the time he sees, I think he's going to see a little bit of a tick up, and that's going to get it closer to double plus territory. But he also has a slider that's above average, a curveball that flashes above average, a cutter that's average at least, and command that I think can grow into above average. Sixth round pick, classic Yankee story of we draft you. We put you in this pitching specialized program we've got going on, re- refine and, and overhaul the arsenal a little bit. And all of a sudden Hampton comes out looking insane uh, with, with the three quality secondaries and a fastball that just has ride that is pretty hard to teach and just seems to flutter right over barrels. Yeah, he is I don't, like I, I'm just looking at all the fives across the board. Get a 65 future on the fastball, but how about a 50 cutter, 55 slider, 55 curveball, 55 command? He is, he's exactly what the Yankees wanted from Will Warren last year. And and I think Warren didn't tick up the way that maybe they were expecting him to. And I think Will Warren's going to make starts for the New York Yankees this year. But I think Hampton surpassed him and then some last year. And Hampton became the better version of that a guy that you feel like could go throw five innings in the major leagues right now. And he's not going to get the opportunity for the first couple of months, but man, like this seems like one of those guys and and one of the very few that will be a homegrown Yankee starter that looks the part. And, you know, we were, we were talking about, Hey, what, what can the Yankees do on the trade front? You know, who are the Yankees going to go out and sign? And a knock on the New York Yankees has been their inability to establish major league homegrown talent. And it looks like they have a shortstop for the foreseeable future in Anthony Volpe. Looks like they may have a catcher in Austin Wells. They have a center fielder in Jason Dominguez. And Chase Hampton is going to be one of maybe two or three starting pitchers that they kind of establish as homegrown talent. And that, in turn, saves the New York Yankees money to go allocate elsewhere. And then that's been their problem, right? It's it's just like... even when they develop these guys pretty well, they just want to cash in because yeah, they ship them I don't know if cash, I don't know if Cashman's like jaded and just thinks like, Oh, well, you know, we've had guys that we hear all these good things about come up and, and they don't succeed as much. And um, you know, but at, at a certain point you got to trust that you you've overhauled your, your development system and, and, and a lot of different things. And you have to feel pretty good about what's happening here. I think it's tangibly different than what I've seen even a couple of years ago, uh, especially from the pitching side, but in general, I mean, look at the leap that Jason Dominguez made last year. Uh, or in the year before that, look at what Spencer Jones is starting to do mm-hmm. in terms of the, the contact and, and just subtle swing changes that have helped him. Same thing with Wells, as you mentioned. Um, and, and we'll see if if they can do that with Pereira now, but you know, you can't do it with everybody. But with Hampton, like you, you got to feel really good about what you got here because the fastballs it just elevates the floor. The, the fastball makes him a high probability back end starter for me because even if the secondaries aren't as good as I think they're going to be which is I think they can all almost be average or better. It's they're still good enough with the command to be able to be a back end starter. I mean, when you have ten, your final 10 starts an in zone whiff rate of 30% on your fastball and a chase rate of 32%, basically, even if you're in a two Oh count, you know, that's telling me like hitters can be sitting fastball and they still can't get it. You know, it still flutters over the barrel of where they think it's going to be like, that is the, the hitters count eraser. And if you have that, that's always going to be an edge that a lot of pitchers don't have. But then when you factor in, as you mentioned, like the 50s to 55s across the board, like that slider has just got become really good. The Yankees have had a lot of success helping their their pitchers develop sliders uh, and then mixing in that taste breaking curve ball. But I also think that cutter is a huge, huge pitch for him because it's hard in the upper 70s and he can locate it east west. Like he was getting a 30 percent in zone whiff rate on that fastball, averaging below 93 miles per hour with it. Wow. He's 22 years old. He's 6'3", 220. You imagine he ticks up one to two miles per hour, I think, which is very possible because there's not a lot of effort in that delivery. I, I know you've seen it. I know you like it. Like, I, 
that could easily be a double plus fastball then. Yeah. So, you know, it's hard to just speculate on on a tick up, but I could see Chase Hampton having another tick up here. It's hard not to forecast a tick up when you watch him, when you watch the delivery, and when you know how young he is. Like all the context, put it into the soup, and you get a tick up. You get 94, 95 from him. Yep. I, I'm, I'm another name that I'm just really pumped to watch, you know, at the upper levels and just see how it looks this year. We're going to get to number 62 in a second. Uh, It's Rhett Louder, the Cincinnati Reds. But before that, a quick break. Number 62, Cincinnati Reds first round pick, Rhett Louder. One of the more satisfying pitchers to watch uh, just because of the way he fills up the zone. I mean, that's why they took him seventh overall. But when you mix three pitches, fill up the zone. And it's really four because you got a four seam fastball and then the two seamer. Then you got the slider and the changeup. Louder's fastball is not going to blow you away. But I think the fact that he has two different versions of it has that kind of two seamer that he gets ground balls with. And then there's good enough shape on the four seamer. And it's not like he's throwing 90. Like he will still surprise you and run it up there a little bit. I think it's going to be a above average fastball when you, when you have the two of those, uh, that slider, the way he commands it really, it's a plus pitch, but the way he commands it, I think makes it play up more. Same thing with the change up. It was funny when we did those, those interviews at the, at the eBay event, louder was awesome. Just being able to talk to him. He says he still goes back and watches that, um, that, championship game or the championship series uh, against LSU. I I thought it might be a sore subject. And he's like, no, this was just too cool. You know, obviously I'm, I'm upset that we didn't win, but you know, I'm throwing against, he did everything. He's throwing against Paul Skeens. Like I I just was curious. Like, did you realize the gravity of that moment beyond just, we're trying to win a championship and he's like, it it was impossible not to realize it. Um, So like, he just so clearly responded to the big stage. Uh, I think that's what really solidified him is the way he pitched down the stretch there. He can go toe to toe with anybody. And it's not the same way that Paul Skeens does, right? Where Paul Skeens is kind of fiery, like I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, F you up. Louder has probably got that if I say that to himself. But when I watch Louder, I just see a guy that's like relaxed and just, he knows it's almost like he already knew the outcome. <laughs> it's like, I know I'm going to carve you all up yeah. and I'm just going to be relaxed and go do it. And that, so when he isn't doing it, you don't really see much panic. The heart rate doesn't get up. I don't think the bad starts can build on him and compound. And being able to talk to him, like it's it's funny where I think most of the time you have this, uh, you imagine what a person's like based on how they're on the field, and then off the field they're you know a lot different. Um, and and people talk about having just like two totally different personas, both on the field and off the field. But Rhett Louder, I watch him on the field. He strikes me as just like this even keel, low heart rate guy. Meet him off the field exactly that way too so it's funny how that can be but i actually love that about rhett louder and i think it's part of the reason why even his his bad days won't be too bad which is we talk about like the true sign of of not even just an ace but just a quality starter in the big leagues is when you're off can you still survive and put together a you know a competitive start i think louder is going to be able to do that as much as anybody Yeah, and I think you do that with the mentality that you're talking about. I think you do that with the pitch mix. You need to have three pitches that you can turn to at any point, and he has three that he can turn to at any point. So like a guy like him, if he becomes a two-pitch pitcher for a day, he will survive, and and that's very important. The other thing, and this word is getting overused in some other spaces, but surgical, Rhett Lauder is surgical. Yes. I I think he is the pitcher on this list that best embodies that where the fastball does not have 20 inches of IVB and the slider. It's really good. It's not vomit inducing pitching ninja type stuff. The changeup could end up on pitching ninja because of the swings that he'll get, but it's not like a take changeup is going to end up on pitching ninja. The way he is labeled as surgical is because he's got 60 command. That's not going away. And it's exactly what you're talking about. He he knows that he can beat you with a million paper cuts yeah. when Skeens was giving you a hook to the jaw and you're going down. Like yeah. Skeens had to knock out like 30 hitters in that game. Louder, he like got him to TKO because he kept kicking yeah. their shin. Yeah. Like it's it's it, it was a different way of winning fights, but they both won fights in that game. And and I love that there are multiple ways to win fights. And I will say, like, he'll surprise you, though, still, too. You know, like, that's the thing is, like, he'll he'll catch you with a right hook maybe when you're not expecting it. And I think that's kind of what the four-seamer is because he uses them pretty evenly. And and the the four-seamer is not going to have 
you know, the best shape in the world, but it's a slightly below average release. And, you know, just every he's wearing you out. He's kind of lulling you with sinker, change up, slider. And then all of a sudden you mix in that four seamer riding upwards and there's just enough life on it that he's able to get the whiffs at the top. I think he's so got to figure I, out exactly how he wants to use those fastballs because I think if he becomes a little too dependent on the four seamer, it doesn't have enough of that life to like we talk about a race hitters counts and stuff like that. He's got to do it other ways. But at the end of the day, it, it's it's uh, there's enough there to to buzz it at the top and, and get hitters when you pick the right spots. And building off of that, his fastball plays up because of the two secondary pitches. That's important yeah. to note. It's like a lot of the time we see a secondary pitch play up because the fastball is good. Like Dylan Lesko, his changeup is really good in a vacuum, but it's great because of how it plays off of the fastball. Rhett Louder, his fastball becomes really good because of how good the changeup and slider are. And it it's an off balance pitch. You yep. never see a pitcher's off balance pitch be a fastball, but Rhett Louder could be that guy. Yep. It's more old school too, uh, to be honest. And and again, another another guy that you're just gonna feel really good about the probability of him getting up to a big league rotation and, and holding his own. And and I think he's gonna climb pretty quickly. The last thing on him was where the other interview that we were doing, like right right after that, was with Matt Shaw. And Matt Shaw's sitting next to me. We're, we're doing the interview. Right behind us is Louder signing the cards. And, you know, Shaw flew through the minor leagues. He got up to double A last year and was there for a decent amount of time. So I, I was just thinking, like, was there a moment where you realize, holy crap, I'm climbing quick. This talent level is is, is ra ra rapidly becoming, you know, very difficult. And he's like, like, of course, yeah, it wasn't. I'm not going to say it was, like, easy to climb. But the guy behind me was the toughest guy I faced all year. So I felt pretty good. And I think, one, that's a testament to college baseball. Two, it's a testament to Rhett Louder because Matt Shaw was facing some really good arms in the low, both in college, low A, high A, and double A. Yeah. And, and again, like I, I just thought that was a cool statement that was very simple. I don't think he was going out of his way to just get, gas up Rhett Louder. Um, but just the fact that he felt as though the most difficult at bat that he had was the lowest level he had played at that year, yeah. I think says a lot about – how nasty Rhett Louder can be when he's on and he's just hitting his spots. Again, nothing that's pitching ninjas, but you go up there and you feel like you you struck out faster than you can blink. Uh, so that's still that's a different kind of nasty. I think he's going to be a name that you hear in that type of question. Like I think that's going to be an answer you hear a lot. Mizorowski's always going to be the name that you of hear course. most because he's you know an alien life form, and we we heard Justin Henry Malloy say it was Mizorowski in the futures game. Like imagine seeing him in the regular season. Yeah. Um, but louder, like I think louder could be an underrated answer there that yep. you get more often than than you'd expect. A hundred percent. Number sixty one, Harry Ford, another guy that fit into those interviews from that conversation for those it's conversations at the event. Thing. It's kind of yeah, that's that's also the clump, I guess, here too. Um, check out that interview with Harry Ford as well. But Seattle Mariners prospect, who I, I mean, look, he, he's just put up numbers at at every stop. Nothing that jumps off the page, but just continues to, I think, impress with just how he handles every assignment while improving the defense. Like that's been a focus for him. He earns high marks for the way he works behind the dish. Uh, I, I think this is just another. We talked about it off the top. I think of the last episode. Harry Ford's one of my favorite examples of why we do this plate discipline great now, because you have, I think ultimately it's, it's a 50 hit tool at best. And I think that's kind of a misconception with him as I see a lot of above average, maybe even plus hit tools uh, labeled for him, but there's going to be some swing and miss there. Like he, he has a blue zone at the top of the zone. That's totally fine when you have a great approach. I, I'm like trout and it's just kind of the way he creates his angles, right? He, it's a guy that kind of brings his hands down. It's a little bit of a barrel tip, but he turns the barrel really well. But if you're a guy that likes to do that, you know, you're going to be able to generate lift. It's going to be a lofty swing, but it's going to be really hard to get to stuff at the top. That's fine because Ford does damage on anything on the bottom. And if you hang it, he feels really comfortable. Kind of cut from that cloth as well, where pull side, he's going to outslug the EVs because of the angle he creates and the way he can backspin baseballs. But it's also the approach. So I think the hit tool is going to be average at best, but we have 70 plate discipline on Harry Ford. Um, and then I think game power that even though the EVs might be average at best, it's going to allow him to still hit at least average power, maybe a little bit more plus runner. The defense has gotten better, but the thing with him that's interesting is we were talking about on the just baseball show, like he had 20 pass balls last year. And so many of them were, were not blocking related. He, he, he moves well, he could get a little bit better fundamentally, but a lot of them were just squeezing the ball. Like so many of them were 
fastball or, or a pitch inside to a hitter. And he kind of does that like, ooh, is it going to hit the hitter or not? Like yeah. almost not trusting where he's sticking his glove. That's just a comfort thing. But I was shocked that that was almost like half of, of some of the past balls. So I, I think that's a really fixable thing. I didn't see as much of an issue with shifting, blocking, moving. He's a premium athlete. Um, I, I think he's going to develop into a, an average catcher at least with the intangibles to, to put him over the top too. How do you get better at those? Because it does feel like that's a, that's an aggression thing. That's a mentality thing. It might be a comfort thing, and that may just come from pro reps. Although Actually, it's just reps. I, it's just reps, and like I think so. That's probably why he should go level by level through mm-hmm. the minor leagues. And he's two and a half years younger than the average hitter at, at every stop. So he was nineteen in low A. He was twenty in high A. It's okay that he spends the entirety of his age 21 season in double A and then he gets to triple A at 22 years old. Like, yeah, it's all right if this guy goes station to station because he was a high school draft pick and he's got a career 416 OBP in the minor <laughs> leagues. Yeah, I mean, he will walk with the best of them. The funniest part is when we talked to him, he had no idea until like the Mariners told him. So that, was he being cute by saying that, or was he genuinely like, yeah, I, didn't I think know he genuinely meant it. I think he genuinely had no clue that he was selective, which is wild. He just said, I, I was a bit look for pitches to, to hit that I want to swing at, and I swing. I, like part of me was like, yeah, is he being cute with that? But he seemed pretty adamant that, that he had no idea. But the funny part is, like, I mean, he knows now, and I guess he's just leaning into it even further. 14% chase rate last year, but he is not the passive guy. Like he's still picking his spots and letting it eat. It's good swing decisions. It's really impressive what he's been able to do there. He walked nearly, he's walked nearly as much as he struck out as a pro as a catcher who has been, as you mentioned, younger than his competition. That's really impressive. Number 60, Thomas Sejazi, St. Louis Cardinals, a hit machine. I mean, this guy really impressed me now in spring training too. He's just going to hit it every stop. And I think people are just going to say, oh, we'll see if it translates. We'll see if it translates. And then it's just going to translate to the big league level. Like he's going to be one of those guys that just, I think he's kind of cut from the the old Ty France effect we like to talk about, right? Where guy just hits at each stop, but nothing jumps off the page. So people start to say, oh, yeah, well, if, if it doesn't translate, you know, if he's not hitting at the same well, like at the same clip at the big league level, well, and then what are we going to, what are we going to dream on here? Blah, blah, blah. And, and I talked about Vinny Pascantino is that guy too. And I think Sejazi is kind of another example of, of a guy like that. The difference is that he's not a first baseman. Like he can actually play a good second base. He can get by at third base. He could, I think, play shortstop in a pinch. And we've seen him do that. So there's more value there. That, but this is a dude that also I think is a, a perfect example of the benefit of the, the plate discipline aspects because I haven't seen anybody give Thomas to Jay-Z a 60 hit. It's a 60 hit. Watch that guy in the box. Simple moves. It looks like he's standing there playing fungo. And he's still able to generate plenty of bat speed and impact. But it's so easy for him that it just looks like he could just make contact, repeat his swing all the time. It's an early leg kick, but pretty much simple hand load. And then he's just throwing his hands in the ball. And he's letting it eat because... He's another guy that generates plenty of backspin paired with bat speed. I I think he is the guy that gets misunderstood in terms of, I think the hit tool is plus, but it doesn't get given a plus because his plate discipline is below average. And so the below average plate discipline can kind of take him out of, you know, take him out of his approach being that, you know, if he was just focusing on pitches in the zone and not expanding, he'd be putting up even more ridiculous contact numbers, but the contact numbers are still really good. And if you look over his last like 50 games last year, which I think would have been almost all in triple a in zone contact rate of like 87% out of zone contact is, is really good as well. And what, what kind of sold me on him being a plus hitter, Jack, let me just take you through pitch types, fastballs, 320, slider, 270, curveball, 345. Change up 250, but he slugged cutter 280. How do you get him out? What do you do? You can try to get him to chase. That's the only thing you can get him to do. And it's hard to get him like he's going to do it, but like it's hard to get deep enough in an at bat 
for him to start chasing and for him to panic. Like it, it feels like he's never panicked. And, you know, it's not often that I'll just bring up like, Hey, minor league leaderboards when it comes to standard numbers, but this guy led all the minor league baseball in hits last year, <laughs> by the way, Victor Scott was second. <laughs> you go to extra base hits. That's the big differentiator for Sajazi. Yes. He was the minor league hit leader. This dude had 66 extra base hits mm -hmm. and this list. Give me the outlier. I don't think there is one. Top 10 in full season minor league baseball in extra base hits last year. Kobe Mayo is number one. 77 extra base hits. Holy <laughs> shit. Austin Shenton, who just made the Rays opening day roster, was number two. So happy for that guy. So happy. 74 extra base hits last year. Colt Keith, number three. <laughs> Troy Johnston, number four, one of the best run producers in the minor leagues last year, maybe the best run producer in the minor leagues. And then after that, Jonathan Perlaza, Thomas Sejazi, Ryan Bliss, Hunter Goodman, Connor Norby. Perlaza is the only outlier. Everybody else is a legitimate big league bat. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. And a lot of them are corner guys, <laughs> you know, like, and, and Jay Z's not. And, and I think that's important too. Like you could kind of move around a little bit. I think that's really important context there because also I would imagine he's young, the youngest guy on that list outside of Keith. Uh, I, he he might, I think he's younger than Keith. Mayo would be the youngest guy on that list. Also but, total bases. So Jay Z led minor league baseball in total bases. Kobe Mayo is second. So Jay Z's younger than Mayo. Man. So, so Jay Z would be the youngest player on that list as well. I think that's the other thing that people forget is like, he won't be 22 until April 10th. So he was 19 at the start of last season. Or excuse me, 20 at the start of last season. And like, that's pretty insane to, to handle the upper levels the way that he did. Not only handle it, be one of the better hitters at the upper levels, through a trade, all that stuff, and, and be one of the younger players at those stops too. Consistently elevates, which is a big reason why. Ground ball rate of just 37%. This is a guy that just backspins balls, and he's going to another outslug the EVs guy. The EVs are average, but the batted ball angles and and the things that he's able to do, uh, I think will always allow him to hit 20 to 25 home runs, and I expect him to hit enough. It's about the approach, but he, he hedges that with good out-of-zone contact rates as well. I'm, I will bet on this bat. It, like That's why he's 60. I know that people might be like, well, that's, I get why you like him, but like that seems a little high for a guy that's you know a little limited when you don't have anything jumping off the page elsewhere. I think he's going to hit, hit for average. I think he's going to hit 20 home runs, and you can sneaky grab some bags when you need and can play multiple spots. It's just a high probability big leaguer that I think has a little bit more in the tank as well to make him an above average big leaguer. So Memphis opens or first full week for Memphis is in Indianapolis next week. I want to sit down with Sejazi. And my first question is going to be, so how do you get all these hits? <laughs> I would love, I would love to hear his answer. I guarantee he's a guy that just goes in the box, pretty empty headed, like simple. And just thinking, I'm just going to go hit. Like he strikes me as that type of guy. And, and I really think that's what, what makes him as good as he is. Last thing on him, spring training, like just more of the same. He hit 300 in spring training, and he got a fair amount of run, 55 plate appearances in big league spring training. Only struck out nine times, walked five. So it's a 16% strikeout rate. Like he's just doing it anytime you see him against anybody. He's going to keep hitting. 59. Tamar Johnson, another second baseman. There's a few trends in this band that I didn't even notice. Like you, we got a lot of second basemen, second basemen in this band too. Yeah. Tamar's got some major juice. We've seen that. He's also got some swing and miss. We've seen that. Uh, we've talked a lot about the the shift in and who he is or how he's perceived, and you know how it was supposed to be plus plus hit, and now it's really plus power and below average hit. The bat speed is so insane. I think we were able to see that up close and personal. But I just think that he's got to calm those moves down to to attain that ceiling. Like you saw it when we were right behind home plate. When he's facing velo and, and good stuff, it just feels like so much has to go right for him to, you know, sync up and and square up a ball and crush it. The thing is, he's so athletic and so quick in the box that he can make those things go right more than most people would be able to with those moves. But there's just so many times where 
He gets a really good swing off, but it just seemed like there was so much movement and, and so many things that could throw him off of his timing. And it's like, oh, he just missed that. I find myself saying that a lot with Tamar Johnson. When he catches it, it's, again, it's jaw dropping. But there's a lot of, oh, he just missed that because of the loud barrel tip, huge leg kick, big posture shift. It's it's amazing that he hits as well as he does with, with that kind of movement. It It did feel very station to station with his kind of load and getting ready for a pitch, right? Where it's hands down, back up a little bit, leg kick, then fire. Like there were, there were steps. It wasn't really fluid. No, that herky jerky nature creates that one fourteen that jumps off his bat at 19 years old, which is unique, but it's also the sheer athleticism. So I think what, what you're begging for and what, really every evaluator is begging for is an opportunity to see what a fluid Tamar Johnson looks like. I love the, the, the thing you brought up about kind of just like the, the movement patterns, because we always talk about like, you look at James Woods load now where it's just, it's slow. And he was always this way, but even more so now where, and same with like, you know, you can look at Aaron judge too, but like it's slow and building. And I know those are big guys, but I could even give you examples of, of like a Colt Keith and some of the other guys where it, it's slow early and, it just allows them to be in a good spot. Whereas if you have a load that has like, and Start then we're talking about this with Marcella Meyer, like yeah. it's, it's tip, tip, tip. And it's just, how do you time that consistently with Tamar? He tips and then there's a pump. And I just think when you're, you have a barrel tip and a pump, how do you consistently time that? That's two moves with your hands in tandem with a big leg kick. And again, like there's freakazoids that can do that, but even look at a Justin Turner, it's slow building and early. It's not like, double pump the hands, big leg kick. And again, the fact that he's doing this and succeeding in any way, and the fact that he still makes good swing decisions because most guys would feel rushed there. Like he sees the ball so well. Uh, I'd argue like the, the joke we have about Dylan Cruz, like the 2010 vision yeah. or whatever. Like I, I guarantee tomorrow has some unbelievable eyesight, but he could make it so much easier on himself because I know he's small. I don't think he needs all that to produce power. You mentioned like the twitchiness and things like that. I think he'd still produce elite bat speed with much less movement. So that's the thing I'm looking at. If Tamar Johnson starts to simplify a little bit more, he could he could absolutely be a monster because he's going to walk, and he's going to walk a ton. He's going to slug. I mean, he's got a 90th percentile in his age 18 season of 105 point something miles per hour. He's going to get stronger. Even though he might not grow a ton, but he's going to get stronger just naturally. I, if he simplifies things a little bit, he could be a, a monster. But right now, it's just there's too much whiff, and that's what holds him back just a bit. Yeah. Number fifty-eight guy that I've had to change his team for now like three times mm-hmm. since uh, like the final drafts of this list, which is crazy. Drew Thorpe. Right-handed pitching prospect with the Chicago White Sox now and part of that Birmingham rotation that's going to be a wagon. Uh, we'll probably do an episode like that next week as well when we get the finalized rosters, just rosters we're most excited to, to follow. Uh, and and Birmingham will be one of them. Uh, Drew Thorpe, we've talked about it. It's it's an 80 changeup. We finally stamped it. Like I, I know that it doesn't have like the – Devin Williams airbender movement, but we've talked about just what makes it so special. Um, it looks like his fastball until it's not. It, and I know that's what most good changeups do, but I don't know if anybody does it the way that he does it outside of like John Means. Uh, and and John Means, I, 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 it's funny, like people laugh, but you look at John Means' changeup numbers, it was one of the best performing changeups in Major League Baseball. Like, has a no hitter for a reason. But on top of that, like, I think Thorpe has a little bit more going for him with the pitch, too. It was just the most. Most changeups, you have a huge separation in vertical movement where it's going to just, it's going to have a ton more drop. Thorpe's doesn't, but I think Thorpe found that perfect middle ground where it doesn't have as much drop as some of the other top changeups. But sometimes that big drop is enough to, to tip really savvy hitters off a little bit and be able to keep the hands back enough to just spoil a pitch. With Thorpe's, you can't because it stays on plane with the fastball so late and so long and then drops just enough so there's like that delicate balance of if it looks too much like your fastball then it's just too straight and it gets crushed uh or it looks close enough to your fastball but is just different enough to have that perfect balance of it's the fastball it's the fastball it's the fastball no it's not and i don't think anybody else 
right now in minor league baseball is making hitters say it's a fastball. It's a fastball. It's a fastball. No, it's not later than drew Thorpe. If that makes sense. Yeah. So limited sample last year, but John means threw it 33% of the time. He threw 113 changeups. Opponents hit a buck 39 against yeah. it. Do you have the standard slash line against Drew Thorpe's changeup last year in the minor leagues accessible? I do. Okay. You want it? Yes. 125, 200, 266. There you go. The end zone whiff rate is what blows my mind. And I think that's a testament to fastball, 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 never mind. Because you are already too too deep into it as a hitter to, to adjust. And you look at the EV50 against his changeup, 76 miles per hour. It's nothing. That means, so that's why no one can adjust. In zone whiff rate over 60%. That's the best figure in the minor leagues of, of, of I think, any secondary pitch thrown more than three to 400 times. So like, is it going to perform the same way against big league hitters? I think that's, it was a fair question, but then spring training, I know he had like, you know, some ups and downs, but the changeup wasn't a reason why he threw 58 changeups in spring training in zone whiff rate over 60%. Right on right against lefties. Doesn't matter. Yeah. That pitch is an 80. The fastball has ticked up slightly and i think that's helped but i think he needs a little bit more uh you know i i, I would like to see that closer to 93 on average than 92.2 or three mm -hmm. but i think what makes thorpe solidly a top 60 prospect the slider it's more of a sweeper has turned into a really good pitch for him he also mixes in the cutter and then he has another variation of the slider that will throw he can just give you so many other looks it's not just gonna be like a fastball changeup guy that it's just north south. He can give you the east west now too. Yeah. Um Elijah Evans is doing an awesome job for us on social media. Like he's he's been killing it. So the tweets that you see from us, the Instagram posts that you see from us and give us a follow on Instagram. We're trying to grow our our Instagram yes. presence. But Please that's do. Elijah and Elijah is one of the hosts on the Future Sox podcast and I I just went on there and he asked me about fastball shape with Thorpe. And like how much of a concern it is. And it's like, hey, yeah, I guess it's a little bit of a concern. You've got a 50 grade on it. The way that I kind of put it was this. Fastball shape may limit his ability to become a frontline guy. But that change up the pitch mix and the fastball being part of that four pitch mix is enough to make him a middle rotation arm. Yeah. And, you know, I, I really don't think the shape is, is bad. It's, I think it's more just the velocity. Like, I think the shape is pretty average, maybe slightly, slightly above average carry, like slightly. Um, I agree with you, though. Like, I think just everything else is good, good enough to make him a mid rotation starter. And there's enough with the fastball and the command of the fastball is huge, right? Yeah. It, that's the other side of it, too. Like, he locates it pretty well. Um, but just to clarify, too, on the secondary stuff, so it gets, it's going to get mistagged on like Savant, too. And, yeah. and that's why I got to refer to the, the write up specifically here. But like, you have the change up and then you have two variations of the slider that I should be labeled as two different pitches. Unfortunately, I think with, with track man, it doesn't know what to do because there's a slider already. So it labels like the, the shorter slider is a cutter. And then the, the lo longer sweep your slider is a curveball, Whereas it's really a cutter and, and a slider. Uh, and then maybe like variations of the slider as well. So that's the confusing part. He has like a true cutter. Then he has a pitch that is like a cutterish slider. And then he has like a sweep your slider, but I love that because he can give you so many different looks. So you have one that's 83 to 85 with more sweep, and it's more of that classic Yankee sweeper. And then you have another at 81 to 83 with the gyro break, which is like that more vertical drop type of slider. So he has something else that's different from the, the changeup that has a similar action that's harder. So it can give you a kind of a different look a little bit. And both of those pitches worked really well for him. I mean, both iterations of that breaking ball, opponents at a buck 80, with a 45% strikeout rate. So he's having success with that pitch as well. And then he'll mix in that cutter to try to tie up lefties and things like that as well. That's more of that horizontal short cutter. So he's got two pitches that you could say either two variations of a cutter or two variations of a slider. Um, or, but either way, like he could just kind of come at you in a bunch of different ways. And I think that's what makes him unique now and, and darn right nasty and also able to not be too change up dependent. It's not going to be a Gavin Stone type of thing where 
he's got to throw the change up all the time. And, and that's really all he's got. And you're just praying he's closer to mid nineties so that the fastball can help him. He's already got the cutter. And then he's got, you know, the, the two sliders there that I think he can go with one or the other. If it's working better, the, the sweepier version is going to dis dismantle righties. He can yeah. go right on right with the change. And he can also go with the gyro version against righties as well. And then lefties, you know, you can just eat them alive with that change up, but Easy. then bring in that more horizontal breaking cutter to tie them up. He's got so many different ways he can sequence and go up, down, east, west, that it's going to keep him from being, uh, I think it really helps mask the fastball for yeah. sure. What's the term barbecue chicken? Like lefties against Drew Thorpe or barbecue chicken. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, which is funny because righties didn't do much better last year either. They had a buck 90 because of all the different ways he can go at you. I was watching some right on right changeups he was throwing well, in spring training, even like Reese Hoskins looking lost, Willie Adamas looking lost. So if you're a righty now, you still got to worry about one of the best changeups in baseball. Yeah. And he can hit you with different sliders and a, and a cutter if you wanted to. Like that's, that's tough stuff. Yeah. 57, Brady House. Washington Nationals, third baseman. Uh, big power. I mean, we talk about the Brady House show that you'll get on the BP side. But also, one of the most aggressive approaches you're going to see. Um, I that, that was one of the more difficult plate discipline grades because it's like, yes, he's super, super, super aggressive now. And maybe that can improve just as he matures. But I also see a guy that just looks like he's always going to be in swing mode. The field of hit can develop into average. But I mean, when you're chasing at, uh, it was almost a 40% clip and it was like 36 and then just kind of climbed as the year went on. It's a little concerning. The swing's flat, which is I think what allows him to make more contact than a lot of hitters his age that generate the power that he generates. And also, you know, I, I think that's going to be the question as to how he balances that, right? If you start to generate a little bit more loft, which I think he should, because he's going to be a power guy over anything, um, is that going to result in more whiff, especially with the very aggressive approach chasing 45% of fastballs specifically? Um, that could be an issue at the top of the zone. But he also had a 90th percentile exit velocity of almost 107 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a, as a 20 year old, I think he was 19 at the start of the season. Uh, and, and he's going to grow into more power. He's 6'3. He's a great defender at third base. He could be a monster, but he's going to need to elevate a little bit more and he's going to need to cut down on the chase. So. I'm curious why you have such a big discrepancy between game power, like present and future right now. You feel, So he had 12 homers this past year. You, you mm -hmm. just think 12 can turn into 30. I think he's too talented. And, and I also think that there's – I'm betting on the fact that he's going to elevate more. Got it. He, he has no choice. Like, yeah. and, and I think he's talented enough to find that um, and, and be able to elevate more. Because the alternative is – and I know he hit like 300 last year, but yeah, that's just not going to happen. So that that's actually, that was going to be my next question. You've got a 40 on the hit for a guy that hit 312. It did. It's it, there's, I don't know how he hit 312. Um, like it, it's aggressive. I, I, well, I guess the way he hit 312 is by hitting the ball hard as hell uh, all the time and, and just having, you know, lesser defense there, but he also is going to be a high BABIP guy because he hits so many line drives and, and that's going to be, you know, what he does, but you'll get the contact rates. Like they're, they're fringy. Uh, you'll get the swing. Like I think there's the potential for average, you know, contact, but I, you combine that also with the fact that I just, I think he's going to start to sell out a little bit more for lift. I think that's where he should go is where the hit tool is fringier and the power is plus because guys with these contact rates at the lower levels, generally are just not going to develop into plus hitters or, or close to that, even with the high batting average that we saw. I just, I think it was more of him just feasting early in counts against more advanced competition. They're going to pit that, that aggressive approach against him, but also they're going to use the scouting report a little bit better and say, Hey, you know, uh, he does not hit breaking balls nearly as well as, as, as he was hitting fastballs this past year. Uh, let's just spin him to death. And I think that's something that we could ultimately see happen, but he could be a guy that ends up outperforming that, you know, that, that hit to a grade I have on him. I just, I think that's where he ultimately trends. Gotcha. That said, I, I think he grows into plus power, good defense at third base. I think the two things we need to see, can you elevate without turning into a whiff machine? And can you cut down on that chase? I think he can do both of those things. If he does that, he's going to climb really, really quickly. Uh, but also 50 hit tool. Like that's, that's pretty good uh, for a guy that's going to have as much power uh, as he's going to have as he continues to, you know, improve. 
56. Last but not least here is AJ Smith Schauber of the Atlanta Braves. Smith Schauber, we've talked about the like unfair assessment of him as well. The Von Grissom effect, the CJ Abrams effect of guy flashes so much ability at the lower levels, team in win now mode or in, under the facade of win now mode. Uh, not in this case, they are in win now mode. Um, says, let's get this guy up here now because he can help us. And maybe he could a little bit, but also you're, you know, you're, you're hurting the development. <laughs> Some that's fine when you're the Braves and you want to win now. But I, I think people forgot very quickly that AJ Smith Shaver was 20 years old last year. And on May 16th, or excuse me, April 16th, he was pitching against Bowling Green in high end. And by what was it? June 4th, he's pitching against the Diamondbacks. Mm -hmm. And so when he struggles against the Reds, and then when he struggles in back in AAA against St. Paul and Norfolk, actually he threw well against Norfolk, but just the point being is it would have been no understandable if he got to AAA and struggled. But he got up to AA for two starts, quickly got out of there, dominated those two starts, got to Memphis for one, really good there, and then threw one more start in AAA, was good there, and they shoved him straight up to the big leagues. Then when he hits a understandable wall and goes back and forth now from the big leagues and AAA, people are like, ooh, I don't know if Smith Schauber has got it. I mean, if we just let him, or we, if, if the, the, the Braves just let him climb high A, dominate there, throw in the Southern League, he would have dominated there. He's a what? Top what prospect in baseball? So that's, that's my thing with him is he gets penalized for being fast tracked and not dominating at the same clip. Like I, 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 I struggle with the, psychology of it all i guess so a couple of guys that we view as long-term projects that project really well aj smith shaver is eight months younger than jacob mizorowski and aj smith shaver is three months younger than tank hence yeah. i mean let's younger than tank hence is crazy that puts yeah, it in like, perspective pretty much. let's keep that in mind the guy that we're saying like oh super young so much potential let's see what he does in the minor leagues aj smith is three months younger than tank hence you have to keep that in mind when evaluating aj smith -Shover. and i was one of the guys that was like pounding the pavement saying like hey he should be the five in that rotation i think they have a good five in reynaldo lopez but hey if something goes awry would you rather pluck AJ from Gwinnett or would you rather pluck Bryce Elder from Gwinnett? I know yeah. who I'm rather plucking. It is one of those where I, I do think in the long term, it's going to be a good thing for AJ Smith Schauber that he has his debut under his belt. And keep in mind, his debut did not suck. Did he no. walk a lot of guys? Yeah, he did. But the, at the end of the day, in his first 25 major league innings, this guy had a 4 2. Yeah. Feel I mean, good about that. That's more than fine. And, and, you know, sometimes coming out of the bullpen and uh, I think towards the end of the season comes out of the pen and goes three and two thirds, one run ball against the Cubs. Uh, and then even, I mean, they're throwing him in, in some important games, I think against the Phillies. Uh, didn't he, didn't he get like an opportunity in the playoffs? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think he did. Okay. I, I'm trying to remember. Uh, yeah, that. he did. You're right. Okay. Two and two thirds, three earned. Yeah. I mean, like I, to not, grade but he's out there like that's crazy that's going to be valuable experience for him without a doubt he didn't have a great spring and i think there's some things he needs to work on that he didn't really get a chance to properly develop the fastball i'm a little concerned about the shape um i think even though just that he got so much ride in those two starts even in, in the southern league i think it kind of bolstered his his overall shape but he throws hard and you know i think he's around the zone he just needs to kind of hit the spots a little bit more but it, it can get a little bit flat on him but he he emerged with in spring training with this changeup that looks way better uh, than, than it had looked last year. The slider he was around the zone with, and he's got the curveball as well. So I, I think this in AAA, just kind of working on the command a little bit. I think there was probably part of him that was nibbling. Uh, and then there was also just part of him that just didn't have enough experience throwing the secondaries professionally. So you had a, a strike rate across all levels last year on non-fastballs that hovered around 
fifty four percent. That's that's not going to work when you know your fastball is not off the charts. So go to AAA, refine the command a little bit further, and I think you can be up in in a month or two and be able to help them. Uh, but I think just making four or five starts in AAA and just continuing to find more confidence in those secondaries. And now I think having more confidence in a changeup that he threw 6% of the time last year, it's really just about the command. And if he walked 13% of batters last year, if that, if that trick, you know, ticks forward, uh, I think he's going to be a really solid middle rotation arm for, for the Braves. I hope so. That'll do it for this episode. We'll be talking breakout prospects with you. I think we're going to put that out over the weekend. So look out for that. Uh, we'll be breaking it down by pitchers and hitters, and then we will be going through the rest of the top 100 next week. And then we'll probably fit, fit in at some point, you know, that that roster preview of of some of the top top teams to monitor this year. Look forward to talking prospects with you later. Actually, on the weekend here, I hope you have a great minor league opening day. Hope you enjoy this baseball weekend, starting the season off, and look forward to talking to you in the next day or two.